Erica for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, <laughs> I, I always think fondly about our time at AmeriCorps and our wonderful teacher. It's been uh, wonderful and um, inspiring kids. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm very honored to be here to be your keynote speaker. I'm told this is the last day of the conference. Oh, so I get to close you guys out. So I'm excited uh, to kind of um, give you guys a break a little bit from the data sets and the, um, the statistics and numbers. Um, but for those of you who are more comfortable in that realm, I will you know, prep you by saying, I don't have any numbers for you. I don't have any statistics for you. I just have my lived experience. So I just ask you to bear with me even in the discomfort of not having data sets and uh, statistics to share, you can count the slides or the number of times that I say perseverance, which is gonna be a lot because the title of my keynote today is The Art of Perseverance. Um, <clears throat> well, once again, my name is Kemi Yemi Ese and um, I have done a lot in my life uh, so far. I think we're gonna try to put up the bio a little bit just so that I'm sharing some of the things that I have done. We're just working on getting to that slide. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so well, that, that is uh, one of the things that we'll be troubleshooting, I'm sure, but um, I have no doubt that you guys are well aware of what comes with dealing with new technologies or even familiar technologies. So um, according to my bio, and uh, some, these are some of the things that I have done. Um, so I am a licensed therapist. I'm also a professional artist as well. Living here in Austin has provided me the wonderful opportunity to be a part of uh, ArtSpark, formerly VSA Texas, and um, other organizations really um, putting me in a seat of advocacy for people with disabilities. Um, I was involved in a car accident in 2006, and that is why I use a, a wheelchair for mobility now. Um, and I was really shocked by the, the level of inability that I had, not because of my car accident, but just because of people's perspectives of what it means to have a disability or uh, physical barriers to buildings. So um, I really was thrown into advocacy because there was things that I needed, whether in hospitals or in working places or schools that just weren't thought of until I approached a door that would not open or I approached uh, a handicap button that was too high for someone in uh, my level of the chair. So I, I come to you speaking of lived experiences and from those experiences, I have been able to really think about what does perseverance mean? me pushing through, why didn't I give up? What is it that um, really inspired me to move on and move forward towards dreams that may have been, or may have seemed out of my reach? So we're gonna talk about what perseverance is. And you know, basically any dictionary will tell you that perseverance is the persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. And, um, I would say that anyone that has any kind of disability um, or feeling a little bit like an other will understand how perseverance is so key. And it's something that a person with a disability is always experiencing. Even if you don't really know it, the things that you are challenged by, the activities that seem difficult, the more that you're pressing through, you are already exhibiting perseverance. Um, we face challenges and limitations set on us by a society that is not always kind or welcoming. And as a person with a disability, um, I can really relate to this image um, that I've added to this presentation. It's an image of flowers coming out of asphalt. And anyone that's driven knows that asphalt is a very sturdy, unforgiving type of material. So for flowers, such a delicate or unassuming beautiful thing coming out of the asphalt. It really shows that there was some struggle and it's important to see that 
anything can come out of something very difficult as long as you are understanding that you have the strength to realize your dreams, whether you are experiencing limitations in a physical disability or otherwise. So all of that is you know, good and well to think about abstractly, but what do I sincerely use for my perseverance? I use a number of things, and this is my perseverance toolkit. I'm going down this list, faith and mindfulness, establishing identity and values, uh, knowing your resources, inner and outer, and having dream and goal flexibility. So starting at the beginning, uh, when I was injured from my car accident in 2006, um, <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, when I was injured from my car accident in 2006, um, I was a senior at Baylor University, pre-med, you know, if you've ever met a pre-med student, you know they have all their lives completely lined up in front of them. They want uh, things done at a certain time and place and they have everything meticulously planned. Um, so when I had my car accident at the cervical level, knowing that I was now paralyzed in my arms and in my legs, how was I supposed to be a doctor? How was I supposed to fulfill these dreams? Um, there was a lot of um, unknown moments that I had to deal with. So one of the, the more core things that I, uh, I knew that I had to rely on was my faith. And I come from a Christian background um, and I appreciate even as a therapist, especially as a therapist, to uh, be able to counsel people who, are, who come from all different kinds of backgrounds, whether they are religious or whether they, um, they don't believe in religion and they have other things that really tie them to their core values. So for me, it was faith knowing that my mom and my dad were praying for me, my family and friends were always um, instilling a sense of um, hope and faith in my life. I know that if you are not aligned with a certain faith, you still have something within you that is like a core value and uh, you wanna feel grounded, you wanna feel steady when you're making a decision. And so for me, I always tell my clients that dealing with something like mindfulness is also helpful. Mindfulness like meditation or just really centering yourself and knowing that your confidence coming from a place deep within you and not from anyone else uh, has been really important. So those are the two foundational things for me, having a faith and uh, knowing that I can rely on mindfulness as well. The next one is to establish your identity and values. I think that it is important for you to know who you are and what you stand for before you can persevere through anything. Um, your identity and your values give you the blueprint for what it is that you wanna achieve. Um, you know, Even though I, I do wear a lot of hats, like Erica said, I cannot wear them all. I need to be um, really specific about what my gifts and my talents are and what my identity is before I can move forward. And after my accident, I really didn't have much of an identity. I wanted to kind of rely on what I was before my accident and leaving. Um, and it left me in a place where I was lacking and I wasn't really appreciating what could I do now? You know, I think I, I was really looking at it from a place of, well, I've never had a disability. Being in a wheelchair and not being able to use my hands in a, in a normal functioning way, well, that counts me out from everything. And uh, it really wasn't true. And I'm glad that I did have a moment where I was able to really assess my identity and feel grounded. And it was a moment where my uh, boss, my former boss handed me a crayon and a sketchbook. And uh, she said, you should just draw, just uh, draw like you used to. Um, when I wasn't working, I was drawing. So uh, it was interesting that she caught me in that way. And then, uh, decided to spring that up on me in that moment. But I drew, I put the crayon in my hand the best that I could. And I just began to, to sketch out things that I thought uh, were just coming to my mind. And it helped me realize that, yes, I was an artist before my accident. Um, doesn't mean that art is counted out after my accident. And um, I was able to create drawings. I was a bit able to um, really get better and better at it because I, I met each challenge with the hope and the faith that my identity is in this thing still. So I'm going to still push through it. 
Um, so the next thing after that, establishing your identity and values is assessing what your resources are, your inner and outer resources. So <clears throat> laying down in a hospital bed, okay, I can draw again, great. But how will I get to be in a space where I can always draw? What, will, what can I do to uh, still maintain a sense of independence and um, agency for myself? Um, I had to lean on the supports of the community. I had to lean on the supports of my family. Um, I relied heavily on agencies like the Texas Workforce um, to give me um, different adaptive aids that I would use to um, be more independent. But a lot of those things I had to ask for. And it's important to know uh, your identity and your values, know what you want, and then know who to ask for those things. Know when to ask for help and when you feel like you can do it on your own. The last, uh, the last tool in my toolkit is having dream and goal flexibility. So like I said, being a pre-med student, I was very rigid. I was thinking, yes, I'm gonna have um, two kids, a dog, a cat, you know, a husband in finance and everything was just so laid out so perfectly. Um, and I think that it, after my accident, I had a moment where I just had no more dreams. I felt that, well, because my identity was tied so much to that first dream of becoming a doctor and, you know, having all these um, semblances of, of achievement and success, <clears throat> that uh, if I can't attain that now, then, well, there's no real point to having a dream, but I realized with that moment of drawing, again, with that crayon, that my dream, my goal was really to help people and help people face mental health challenges. My major at, at Baylor University was neuroscience and I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And so that was the uh, field of medicine I wanted to get into. But knowing that I can still draw again made me also feel hopeful that, well, maybe I can still be in the medical field in some capacity. Well, what do I have? So going back to the, your resources, my inner resources, I, I can talk to people. I love having conversations and I don't need to walk um, to do that. Um, so I realized that there is a field for me and I found it in therapy. And you know, becoming a therapist has been one of the most um, wonderful experiences really because it, it made me realize that I am having a flexible dream. I am still uh, I'm still achieving my core value in wanting to help people with mental health uh, issues and challenges. But instead of doing it manually as a neurosurgeon, I'm doing it in a way that I'm giving that other person an empowerment. Um, I'm giving the client uh, a tool for them to use themselves instead of just coming to me and say, okay, fix me. It's more like, well, how can I help you notice that you have the tools within you? Um, and, you know, as as, uh, as complicated as it may seem sometimes to think about all the resources that you have or you don't have, or who do you ask, I think it's important that you think of yourself as a seed. So you have it within you to grow and you have all this potential to do so many things in your different professional fields and personal um, uh, aspirations. But if that seed is not planted in the place where it can actually be nurtured, then it's not going to grow. So, you know, perseverance kind of comes in two parts, assessing what you have within you and your dreams and your values. And then also knowing, am I in the right environment for me to grow? And I can definitely say, you know, coming to Austin and, um, and being a part of such an amazing art community and, um, and things of that nature, I feel like I'm definitely planted in the right place for me to grow. So, okay, so that list is you know, practical and, and talking about what the toolkit kind of looks like in the form of a list, but what it looks like in my day-to-day -day is a little bit more interesting. So having a disability is kind of like playing Tetris. It's trying to be where you can fit in, um, knowing that it won't always fit in perfectly, but if it's functional, then it works. Um, I mean, you guys have already talked so much about accessibility um, so this is kind of, um, it's easy for you to, to grab that concept. Some of the things that I've used as an adaptive aid for my life, for work, and for my pursuit of art, my manual, 
a chair and power chair. Um, I use a sliding board. I have an adjustable bed. There's so many things that I use as an adaptive aid that just make things easier for me and make me feel less limited, really. Um, I drive. Um, below on this slide, I have a photo of my, my van, which is a Toyota, Toyota Sienna. And um, another photo that I have is a, the inside of my, my driving area where I have different adaptive um, aids kind of attached to the steering wheel to help me drive. Um, I think that it is a wonderful uh, advancement for people with, for uh, wheelchair users to be able to drive. And um, I can only imagine the, the people who created these vehicles um, coming up with that idea and coming across a lot of roadblocks or challenges um, to this whole concept. So I'm just very grateful for their innovations. And, um, and I think that as, as wildly as I may drive on the road, I, I try to be just as, as safe as anyone else. And these adaptive aids help me in that, uh, in that way. So uh, as an artist, I have learned to kind of take certain uh, supplies and adapt them to my needs. Um, on the next slide, it's kind, of been, it's kind of been my journey as an artist to just use tools in the way that works for me. And uh, one of, one of, a quote that I've, uh, I've heard recently that I feel is, is so uh, inspiring is that broken crayons still color. So even though I had uh, you know, this onset of a disability and I, I really felt like, well, everything in my life is so devastated by it, I can still function. I can still impact other people in a positive way. I can still do something to leave my mark on the world that has uh, little to do with what I can't do as far as walking or um, things in, in that way. So on this slide, I put a picture of one of my first drawings uh, and it's uh, sketchy. There's a lot of uh, mistakes that I probably see in it, but it's of a little girl that is folding cross-legged on, well, she's sitting cross-legged on the floor and she has kind of a sad face. And I, I drew this because there were a lot of things that I could not express in words to people. Um, and so art really helped me be more expressive about my experience at the onset of my disability. In the middle, I uh, have placed a picture of me actually leading an art class um, it was a drawing class that I did through the George Washington Carver Museum here in Austin. And in the photo, I am using oil pastels, but oil pastels are really short and hard to deal with. So I taped them to longer paint brushes. And um, that was one of the things that I've adapted for my use, knowing that I still need to be able to draw. I still need to be able to uh, even impart some kind of artistic knowledge to other people. How could I make sure that my supplies are um, are fitted for me. Um, and so going through that, I was able to advance myself and, and get better with my technique. And one of my uh, more recent drawings is on the, the right of a woman with an elongated neck and her skin is glowing with different colors. And in the middle picture, you can see, uh, in the middle picture, I'm actually drawing this picture as in a guide for my students. So it's, been really empowering to come from a, a, a place where I thought I had no dreams, where I had uh, no options or a idea of any kind of success. And with adaptive aids, with people who believed in me, with my faith and uh, knowing that I have different supports, um, it really helped me persevere and get to a place where now I'm teaching art rather than just working with crayons. And um, it's just been a, a very, I would say just a, a, a beautiful experience, even with some of the uh, harder challenges that I've faced. So in the idea of um, my artwork, uh, these are some of the paintings that I have done recently. And I wanted to talk about some of the symbols that I use in my artwork and what they mean. So the symbols that I use come from the Akan culture of Ghana and the Adiri culture in Nigeria. And I'm myself a Nigerian American. 
So I do my best in my recent work to incorporate my heritage in my artwork. And some of the symbols that I've used in my artwork really stand for um, some important things in my life. So the very first one, of course, is perseverance. Um, there's a symbol that represents the power of love, uh, the universe, uh, the waves of life, the talking drum, which in Yoruba culture is um, a way that we storytell with rhythm and knowledge. As you can see in these pictures, um, and I'll describe them as well, um, this, these drawings are on papyrus. They're drawings of three different women that are um, covered in the symbols that I just described from uh, uh, the last slide. And each of these women are interacting with the symbols in a different way. One is interacting with the universe. Uh, one is interacting um, by drawing on her own neck, which is to symbolize where I got injured in my uh, car accident. And another one is interacting with the idea of being infinite or uh, having different ideas of what life is interpreting. So um, <clears throat> these symbols um, kind of create a tapestry of meaning for each drawing that I've done. And one of the symbols that I wanna talk about more specifically today is the Wawa Abba symbol. This symbol is a circle with a line down the center and at the top of the, the circle are three protrusions along with the same as the bottom, three protrusions on the bottom. And to me, it kind of looks like a turtle. Um, and so uh, looking at that, it, it really represents the seed of the Wawa tree. And the seed of the Wawa tree is the Adinkra symbol for hardiness, toughness, and perseverance. Um, in this Akan culture, it's a symbol of someone who is strong and tough and inspires the individual to persevere throughout hardship. And so in thinking about perseverance and thinking about using this symbol to represent um, something that inspires me to push forward and to face different challenges with flexibility, to face different challenges knowing my inner and outer resources, I'd like you to think about what symbol comes to mind for you. So in that, um, thinking about a symbol or a token or even just a situation or a person or a relationship that you have in your life, what about that symbol makes you think about perseverance? Do you keep the symbol near you? For me, I incorporate perseverance in many pieces of my artwork through that symbol of the Wawa Abba um, symbol. So if you have something that you keep near you, do you look at it often? Does it remind you to do a certain thing when you're facing a challenge or different circumstances? Um, I think that it's important to, to remember that you are persevering even if you're just facing something that you think is small like traffic or um, an unruly coworker or a friend that is uh, taking more time than you expect. But I think in those moments, knowing that you can tie yourself to a symbol of persevering, it helps you, it helps remind you that you are stronger even in the moment that you don't feel that way. So, um, you know, taking in that moment, I wanted to kind of have a little bit more of a conversation um, with that. So, I mean, that sort of concludes my portion um, of this presentation. And I wanted to just remind you all that uh, engaging in the art of perseverance requires the sharpening of each tool and enduring the pressure within the challenge that you're facing. And, you know, coming into Access You this year and talking about the different moments of uh, access that you create and accessibility that you create on the digital landscape, um, I think that it's, it's good for you to realize that in your own professional realms, your perseverance is uh, a benefit to people like me who need adaptive aids, who need to be seen 
um, as independent people with autonomy and agency. So the fruit of your perseverance, I get to actually enjoy when I'm on a website that I don't have to fumble around for, or when I'm uh, driving in my car and knowing that this car is suited to me. So uh, that's just something that I'd like to leave you all with. But like I said, um, I'd like to hear from the audience if you have a symbol or a token or, or something that represents perseverance to you. I think we it would be good for for us to share about that. And, and also uh, for those of you who are joining us over Zoom, if you'd like to unmute um, and ask a question, we have that. For those of you who are here, uh, we have some microphones that we can bring to you. And I'm open if no one, well, if, if you don't really wanna share about your own you know, idea of perseverance or symbol. If you have any questions for me, I'm sort of an open book and I'd rather answer questions than kind of just hear myself talk. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions or thoughts. I have and I'm a question. Sorry, do, you, do you mind introducing Oh, yourself? yes, hi. Kemi, that was a great talk. I love meeting you. You were legendary before I met you. So, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm Sharon Rush. I, I work for Nobility. Erica is my colleague, and she talked about you around the office. And when she said that y'all taught um, robotics together, I said, um, oh, that'd be great. Let's get somebody who taught robotics to come be, do a keynote. And the more she told me about you, the more I was like, yes, yes, we have to have Kemi. And then, uh, and then Celia, who was my friend of many, many years, said, so you took my artist of the month as your <laughs> keynote. So we've, you know, we've, we've been uh, just basking in your glory. Um, but anyway, I'm so, so glad to have you here. And from the moment, Erica told me about y'all teaching robotics to, what was it, fourth graders? Yeah, it was fourth grade. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that you would tell us a little bit more about how that was, how did the kids respond, mm -hmm. um, you know, to just the fact of, of uh, because I'm sure if they're fascinated in robotics, they were probably interested in your wheelchair. Oh, yes. And immediately. What it, yeah. So yeah. how tell us a little bit that about that. That was one of the selling points, you know, like, oh, robotics, look at the wheels, guys. Like, this is, this is awesome. So um, with AmeriCorps, we taught several different kind of like learning modules. So robotics was one. Um, I even did a forensic science one. Um, and that was really fun, too. But the robotics one, we had um, almost like the, the Lego mind mind storms and so uh the kids were able to um just think about different things that the the robots would have to do and kind of program them in that way so once they got over the fact that yes i use a wheelchair i think for them they also became came to realize that robotics means more than just creating some figure that does things but robotics can also mean helping someone with a disability and even though yes my chair is not a robot but the mechanical parts of it i think that the the kids really got to see what application looked like more than robots are for entertainment and for fun but really the application of the same um the same skill and the same interest can motivate someone to you know make something like a wheelchair or an adaptable van so, and they were, they loved my van too. I think me and I have really kind of sold the whole mechanics and robotics, but look at this, you know, cool van. Can you imagine, you know, someone, you know, driving from a chair in this way? And yeah, so it's, it's always really cool uh, to be able to sell it in that way. Yeah. We had to constantly tell the kids that, no, we're so sorry, you can't have a ride. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, I think we have another. Thank you. Hey, me, my name is oh. Ariella. Um, oh. Thank you for being here today. Oh, I you. loved your presentation. I'll start by talking about my symbol of perseverance. Nice. I have a ring that I borrow from my, from my grandmother. It has a stone called Larimar, and it is a stone from the Dominican Republic. And my grandmother purchased it 
she has six children that she had to feed. So she would go to the market and she found this ring and she purchased it with like her last hundred pesos. Mm -hmm. And then every time she needed money, she would take it to a pawn shop to get money. And she did this for years. So this was like her pawn shop ring. And so now I wear it on my hand as a reminder that, you know, she always got that ring back and now I got to wear it. And, And that's my symbol. But I do have a question for you. Okay. Um, you talked about um, you were a pre-med student and you were on the path and then you had this accident that happened. And for many of us who are not born with a disability and become disabled due to sickness or circumstances or age or, or whatever, there's always a sense of loss. And that's one of the things that I noticed from the first drawing that you showed which was a little girl that was really frustrated. And then you showed that other picture full of colors and and just you thriving. And I think that that's really testament to your journey. So I'm really curious and I want to ask, what is it that changed? What is it that made you think, I am not going to let this be my story. I'm not going to let myself be frustrated. I'm not going to let my circumstances define the rest of my life. This happened. What was that thing that made you decide I'm going to define my own narrative? So uh, one, I want to say that that was a beautiful uh, example of perseverance. And I was actually going to also say, yeah, it's it's wonderful that your grandmother was so um, sure and confident that she would get that ring back. Um, I think that's wonderful. And thank you for sharing that. So, um, you know, to answer your question, it really wasn't just one thing that happened for me. I think it was a series of things that I I realized, okay, I really can't just uh, sit and think that I've lost everything. So first was definitely um, getting the crayon in my hand from from my boss and for her to encourage me and prayers and stuff from my family. All those things kind of happened to me um, to inspire me. But there was another moment that happened that really made me feel, okay, my dreams are possible. They can be flexible. And, you know, I kind of feel silly to say, but I I had this moment um, at the Miss Wheelchair Texas pageant. And I didn't think I would mention, you know, pageantry in that way, but I really came across a lot of different women with disabilities who were lawyers, who were doctors, who were advocates in their own rights, who had different passions that maybe I didn't align with completely, but they were pushing through and persevering in their own journeys. I met one woman um, who wanted to advocate for um, uh, companion monkeys instead of companion dogs. Um, And I thought that, okay, well, I don't really want a monkey, but she wanted to make sure that people had access to companion monkeys. And she was really, really passionate about it. And I admire her passion. And so, you know, to answer your question that way, maybe that was um, one of the really breaking points that made me feel like, okay, if she wants companion monkeys and she can get on stage and talk about how important it is, well, what's my passion and what's my excuse for not pushing forward and really achieving my dreams in that way as well? That's cool. I'm curious, would it be okay if I ask about your time as a uh, wheelchair in Texas? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, this mic's a little Would Maybe if I stand up, see if we can make the signal better. Um, would you be open to a question about your time as Miss Wheelchair Texas? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. What was that like for you balancing the, the part of being a, a beauty pageant queen and also, you know, wanting to, I imagine, you know, walk a fine line when it comes to inspiration. Oh, okay. I think that is a really good question. Um, and one thing that I also really appreciate about the Texas, the Miss Wheelchair Texas pageant is that it really wasn't focused on beauty. I mean, yeah, we like to dress up. We like to wear the glittery gowns. I still have, you know, my crown um, you know, on, on a shelf somewhere, but it really wasn't so much about that and the beauty aspect. And um, it was really about inspiring people to 
do more with their own lives and to really um, bring some of the challenges that people with disabilities face. Um, and you know that the point that you made about walking the fine line and inspiration, it, it is, uh, there is a fine line between being inspiring and just being almost uh, seen as an object of inspiration. Um, and I think that when I wanna be inspiring, when I wanna share my story, I welcome it to be a conversation so that it's not just about my experience and okay, yeah, I've done all this stuff in my life. And yes, uh, just take this as an example, but engage with the person that you're speaking with um, and, and, and know that we are all kind of having our own inspiring moments, but me being here in a wheelchair is just a little bit of a brighter spotlight or more uh, seen as, well, if they can get through getting, being in a wheelchair, then maybe I can do more. But I think also the wheelchair actually helps me. It doesn't limit me. And my disability is really um, kind of focused in bad design. And I think that's one of, one of the other keynote speakers has kind of touched on that as well. If there were sliding doors everywhere, ramps everywhere, my wheelchair really wouldn't be out of, uh, it wouldn't look out of the ordinary at all. I would be able to assimilate it and really be a functioning member of society because I have no barriers. But because my barriers are so evident, that's when it becomes, oh, wow, she's so great and inspiring. But if that doesn't call you to do more for the community of people with disabilities, then it just becomes this oh, object of inspiration, but not really a call to action. Yeah. I hope that wasn't too long. I felt like that was a bit of a long answer for that. But you're always welcome to say no. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. Hi, Kimmy. Oh, um, hello. I'm Celia with Artspark Texas. Oh, nice to see you again, Celia. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to share with you my uh, symbol of perseverance, mm -hmm. um, which is a tree. And so I find that uh, when I am facing um, some really deep uh, challenges to, you know, finding meaning at certain part times in my life, um, I can always just uh, go out and find a really remarkable tree and it brings it all back to me, the reason why, <clears throat> why we're here. And I don't want to talk about that anymore. And what I want to do <laughs> is I would like you, and I think this is a perfect segue from what you were just saying about your, if, you know, that I think you just said that your, your, the disability is, a uh, is, is in bad design. Yeah, it, and then you were talking about how if every door opened automatically and every stair had a ramp that you would not be noticeable. You would just be part of, part of uh, society. So with that notion and thinking that you've got a lot of people here who are working on websites and technology and different things, what are some of your dreams uh, for what would make the world a more universal place to be in that you think that some people who are um, inventors, entrepreneurs, creators, uh, might be able to uh, work on to make the world a more universal place for everyone to be in? I think that's a wonderful question, Celia. Um, there, I mean, there's so many things. It's, it's uh, you know, thinking about, you know, coming from the, my perspective with my limitations, um, having, uh, accessible uh, doctor's offices where I, I mean, you would think that a doctor's office, everyone is, you know, uh, being able to receive medical attention, but I can't unless I bring someone with me. So they would have to actually pick me up and put me on it. I mean, those examination tables are really high. I don't understand why they need to be that high, but they don't come down much. So I'd have to bring someone with me. So in hospitals, just having examination tables that always go all the way to the ground um, other things that would make every, make things more universal would be uh, even housing, just knowing that uh, I don't have to go to an apartment or a home and think, okay, is there going to be a step there? Is it going to be, um, or the counter is going to be too high? Um, things like that. Um, or, or if I go into even a place like FedEx or, or do grocery shopping, is, are there gonna be things that are gonna be completely out of my reach? So having things a little bit lower level um, and knowing that 
I have um, I have the the option to bring someone with me rather than the necessity to bring someone. I, I wish I had more time to think about that because now I'm thinking, okay, well, what else have I had to like rig up that could actually be just an invention rather than um, my own like tool? I'll email you. Okay. <laughs> Do we have any other questions or um, notes for perseverance or anything? Uh, oh yes, and online, those of you who are Yeah, I'm gonna us. check the chat really quickly. Oops. Hi, Kimmy, it's April. Hi, Hi April. Uh, I have a question about the pieces you did on the papyrus, mm -hmm. the, uh, the hands, the black hands with the gold on the tips. How did you do that? I can't tell if it's drawing or photographs. Or oh, uh, no, it's doing? it's painting. Wow. So I, it's a papyrus piece that I uh, painted oil painting on top of. So the hands yeah. are oil paint. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the hands are oil painted. Are those new ones? I have not seen those. Oh, no, uh, they're, okay. they're older ones, but um, I, I have them displayed at a restaurant here in Austin. And I usually, when I have paintings displayed at that specific restaurant, they stay there for like a long time. So they end up not being seen by public too, very often. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It, and we did have some questions come in in the chat. Um, okay. Thanks, Mariella, for bringing the chat over to me where I can get it instead of me fiddling with the slides. Um, so I'm gonna go through the list and um, Thanks again, Kemi, for answering all these questions. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going up and down. Okay. Oh, we have we have another Americorps alum in here. Oh, really? Yeah, we That's have lovely. Vista. Awesome. Sorry, who? Uh, uh, someone from Vista. Okay. Yeah. So not quite state and national like us, well, but, you know, but Vista, we're yay. All friends. We're all friends here. <laughs> um, we have a question. Do you ever practice digital art on a tablet, for instance? Uh, this is from Sean. And are there tools? Fiddling, fiddling with this now. Are there programs or tools you would recommend for digital artists with disabilities? Okay, I wish I had a really good answer for that. Unfortunately, I don't, um, I don't really do digital artwork. Um, I did have to take a graphics design class when I went back to Baylor uh, to finish my studies, but uh, I work primarily with uh, traditional media like oil paint, acrylic, and canvases. Um, but I, I have used Photoshop, but that was also a long time ago. And things have probably changed. There's probably something better out there. But I'm sorry, I wish I could answer that question. And we have some awesome uh, symbols of perseverance. Okay. Um, should I read them out? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's share them. Okay, so Lindsay says, uh, thank you for being here. Stars are my symbol of perseverance. They make me think of the universe and how it's infinite and full of possibility. Oh, that's wonderful. Stars, yes. Um, someone, oh, Marie is still trying to figure out hers. I think a lot of us will be kind of taking that question okay. home. Nice. Mark says, one of my favorite symbols of perseverance is a picture my brother gave to me of the Booker T. Washington quote. I have learned that success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome. That's wonderful. I think that's great. That's a great quote. We've got another one here while we're while you going through. It. Oh, we have another question. If you can't be oh, can you hear me. Thank you for your uh, presence, for your talk. It's very inspiring. And I wish, as you pointed out, they will be at the point that you will not need to be an inspiration, but you are right now. So thank you. I appreciate um, that. Thank but you. Uh, I, the first two points or the first 
bullet point you know, that you had faith and mindfulness are near and dear to my heart. So I was just curious what kind of, what methods do you use? How do you achieve your mindfulness? So for mindfulness, I, I do breath work. One of my favorite um, breath works is to take in a breath for four seconds, hold for two, and then releasing for eight. Because really, when you're in a chaotic situation, when you're troubled, the only thing you really can control at that moment is your breath. And so recognizing that kind of centers me. Um, I like to uh, picture a rainbow. So it's a rainbow that I create in my mind. And then I look at my environment and look for points in that environment that represent the color. So if I'm thinking, well, I mean, beige is not a part of my rainbow, but there's a lot of beige happening here. So I would, in my mind, think of the rainbow, there's beige. I'd look, okay, there's beige. I'm in this auditorium, I'm safe. I'm in a place where I'm welcome and I'm, uh, I am uh, a valued person in this space. So that helps me uh, feel more grounded and centered and, and present in where I am. So the rainbow um, and breath work are two of my favorite uh, tools for mindfulness. Do we have any other, anyone else want to share or any questions? We have a good symbol that just came in and this is perfect for our STEM education experience. Okay. This is from Steven. Honestly, seeing the first image of a massive black hole that was released today really reminds me of perseverance because it's destructive, but in theory, when it dies, it doesn't actually die and it releases more things out into the universe that create other things. Hmm. I didn't know that black holes did that, that they <laughs> do. They give us stuff back? Yeah, they, it shoots out the ends. It goes in and then shoots out. Yeah. Well, there you go, science. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see astronomy, so. Uh, <clears throat> well, we do now. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> We have another. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I think the microphone is. Okay, real close. Oh, there you go. Hi, Kemi. I'm Becky Gibson. Thanks for your hi. story. I will share my symbol of perseverance. I I reluctant somewhat because it's not. I'm not looking for sympathy, um, but I lost my husband eight years ago mm -hmm. to cancer, and so my symbol and I wear it around my neck is his wedding ring. Wow. And I made, I had a bead made with some of his ashes that I got to make. They made it the color of his eyes. And I wear that all the time. And, and to me, it's not only perseverance, it's more resilience. Like wow. I have no choice, right? Mm -hmm. Your world changed. You have no choice. You have to go on. So that's what I do. And it's funny because as I wear it, I get many, many compliments on it, even though, you know, to me, it has special meaning, but it's mm -hmm. just pretty in its own right. So. And look at that. I think mean, that's wonderful, especially because, you know, you touched on something that is important that for you, you felt like you had no choice. Some people feel like, okay, but they have no choice, but in the opposite direction, I have no options. I have nothing that can push me forward. So I think it's beautiful that you, in that experience, are feeling that you have nothing, you have no choice but to succeed and to push forward. And thank you for sharing that. That's beautiful. Do we have anything else? Well, I don't, I don't see anything else coming in in the chat. Okay. And I think we're good on questions. So Kemi, thank you again uh -huh. so, so much for coming and joining us today and sharing your story and your symbols of perseverance and how we can persevere. And uh, let's just have a round of applause for Kemi. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It was a complete honor. Thank you. So sorry, one more question. Oh, okay. Yeah. How can people contact you after oh, this presentation? I'm sorry, I did not put my contact. That's I brought okay. business cards, like, like uh, but uh, yes. Yeah, so you can reach me at uh, on my Instagram page. That's where I keep most of my art contacts, and that is Kemi's Art. Dot, oh, sorry, Kemi's Art, and then my website is Kemi's Art.com. And as far as counseling, um, I work for NEMA Counseling here in Austin. 
we do telehealth as well as uh, in-person um, sessions here in Austin. Excellent. Yes, I did bring this.